Uh, my name is Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, currently taking a break from uh, discussing Frank Zappa. And because I talk about the dead a lot and because the dead are connected to Zappa through the song Teenage Wind on You Are What You Is, I am ranking and reviewing all the sort of official canonical dead albums. And we are now on number 10 out of 22. 22 through 11 are elsewhere on this channel if you're interested in those. But now we're going to do three. Um, and then at the end of this video, I'm going to tell a really long story about how I found out Brent Minlin died. Um, so after I'm done reviewing number eight, you can just turn it off unless you just want to get bored by a, a story I think is interesting about how I found out that Brent Midland passed away, um, which that, of course, is sad. Um, the story is just kind of effed up, if you ask me. But anyways, um, on to number 10. Number 10, um, this is probably a little bit higher, closer to number one, but it's just kind of slipped back, but not a much. Still a phenomenal album, in my opinion, much better than the other acoustic album or the other album that has acoustic music. And that is A History of the Grateful Dead, Volume 1, Bear's Choice. This came out in 1973. It's a single LP. First side is acoustic. Second side is electric. It's all from February 1970 Dead shows. Um, there is no Volume 2. And Bear is Owsley Bear Stanley, the... Uh, sound man for the dead for a while um i think most infamously known as the inspiration for kid charlemagne uh steely dan he um uh, electric kool-aid acid um he was a man who made in and helped people achieve psychedelic enlightenment um i was told several times early in my dead tour um that uh uh owsley was on tour selling jewelry and people had pointed him out to me. I honestly never researched it um, until I actually was sitting down right now. I was like, I have been told that, hey, that's that's Bear, that's Owsley, that's the guy right there. Um, at Dead Tour, and like probably like early on, like 86, 87, and a couple times I think he provided, people told me that the enlightenment that was provided was from him. So I may have had interactions with him. I don't know the truth of that. All I know is his name was thrown around in the parking lot scene when I first started and that apparently he was still around, but I know nothing about that. All I know is he apparently curated this album. It is seven tracks, uh, side A, five of them are acoustic, the other side two are electric. Um, I just, not a big fan of acoustic music, which is why Reckoning is probably farther down the list because it's an entire album. This is just a side. Um, a couple of these songs appear on Reckoning. Um, I just like the, the this, there's a, a raw or edge to this. They're not like, they sound great. They're not really gritty and dirty. There's just something maybe a little simpler and straightforward about this um, compared to the Reckoning stuff. But the songs are Katie May, uh, which uh, Pigpen sings, Dark Hollow, the Bob song, Bob sing, that Bob sings. I've been all around this world, which Jerry sings, which is a great sort of Ruby Ridge. I'm gonna like fight off the government. I'm hold up with weapons type song. Um, Wake Up Little Susie, which is kind of like, comes out of nowhere, it's kind of an anomaly. Wake up, little Susie. But then it they make it work. And it, it kind of works between I've been all around this world, Wake Up Little Susie, and then a phenomenal Black Peter. Just great, great version of Black Peter. Such an amazing song. Um, and then side two is Smokestack Lightning for a good, uh, I think like 17 minutes or something like that. Uh, and then a hard to handle. So you get a lot of pig pen in the electric, but I really like Smokestack Lightning. I just absolutely love the original version of that song i think this cover is great it pretty much is that groove i can't really do it um for like the entire 70 minutes you know and it, they there's some solos and usually it's like a verse from pig pen little solo more pig pen verse solo verse from pig pen longer solo i mean it's just kind of that for 70 minutes but i just think they just establish an amazing groove it's a fun song um, and then Hard to Handle, which is a great cover. So yeah, uh, it's a good album, man. I just, I really like it. Pretty much straightforward acoustic stuff on side A and just some good long, healthy blues jams with a lot of pig pen on side, side B. It's one of the first things I ever heard of that in Live Dead. Um, and I've always liked it and this is probably the lowest it's ever fallen. But yeah, number 10, History of the Grateful Dead, volume one, the only volume, Bear's Choice. And number nine, um, Grateful Dead, um, AKA Skull and Roses. This was a two LP set, live material released of 
um, 71 material, and I think it was also released in 71. Yeah, um, uh, all 71 released, the material 71. Um, there's just a lot of really good songs on here. I think the performances are pretty solid. Um, the reason it falls down, it's uh, two LPs, so four sides. The reason it's all the way down to nine is side three just has never really worked for me. Um, so side one, you get Bertha, Solid Bertha, Mama Tried, which is a great uh, cover, uh, Big Railroad Blues, which I think is one of my all-time favorite uh, Jerry covers. Absolutely love that song. Like, I think I can remember that the handful of times I saw that when it popped up. It seemed like maybe once or twice on a tour. Absolutely love that song. Um, and a playing in the band, which sounds like it was edited. Um, I've never heard the original. I think there's these are Hammerstein ballroom shows is what I, um, I remember from 71. Um, and I've never gone back and listened to the source material. I don't know if it's out there, but it really sounds like it's the song. And then right when they go into the jam, they go right into the reprise and they just edit it really, really smoothly, um, which is fine. Um, I still I still think this is a great song. I like this version though. There's literally not a single jam at all in it. Um, Side two is just the other one, just a version of the other one. Um, I think it's like 18 minutes long, 18 minutes long. Uh, that's the second part of the That's It for the Other One from uh, Anthem of the Sun, Oxo Moxoa. I always get those two confused. Um, I honestly don't know. Um, from Anthem of the Sun, from Anthem of the Sun. Um, uh, it's just that second part, that Bob start part, the Spanish lady come to me, 18 minutes of that. And then side three starts off with me and my uncle. I like me and my uncle. That is a song that has never bothered me. I could hear that on every tape at every show. I love that song. Two and a half minutes of just Bobby Brilliance. Three minutes of Bobby Brilliance. Cover song. Um, uh, country. Me and my uncle. Um, and then Big Boss Man, me and Bobby McGee, and Johnny B. Good. And those three songs just don't do it for me in these versions. Um, and so I just... The Big Boss Man doesn't do it for me. The Me and Bobby McGee, I think it's just kind of a lifeless version. And Johnny Be Good, I really don't need to hear the dead doing Johnny Be Good. So side three knocks us down to nine. And then uh, the final side, Wharf Rat, amazing song. Uh, and then a Not Fade Away, Going Down the Road, Feel Bad. Um, great way to end this set. Like That's like 18 minutes total, I think, those two songs. But yeah, really solid live material. There's not really any... The other one is the only sort of real deep jam, but you do, you get one deep jam with the other one. You get some pretty good solo jams with Wharf Rat, Not Fade Away, Going Down the Road, some great solos sprinkled throughout, some good song selections, and just how you respond to Big Boss Man, me and Bobby McGee, and Johnny Be Good, you might like this more than I like this. So yeah, number nine, Grateful Dead, Skull and Roses. Number 1098. All right, this might be controversial. I know there's a lot of people I know personally who despise this album, but that more has to do with their experience and with how it changed the scene when it came out. But we have In the Dark, the 1987 release um, from The Grateful Dead, the release that essentially changed everything and probably ultimately killed the scene. So... Um, I had already been going to shows at this point. I was still in high school, so I was pretty much only seeing local shows. Had yet to like fully jump on and do like a, a, a swing on the West Coast or a summer tour or anything like that. Um, but I did see like the number of times they played Irvine Meadows, like triple. Um, the size of the venues, all of a sudden they were playing big, bigger venues in the Los Angeles, Southern California area. Um, and there were more people at them, far more people. And then they, of course, played Anaheim Stadium with the Dylan and the Dead thing. Um, but for a 16 and 17-year-old kid, I'm like, don't you want everyone in the world to like the band that you're realizing is becoming your favorite band? I mean, that's what you want, right? So it didn't bother me at all. I thought it was awesome. And I thought the Dead responded to that energy at all the shows I saw. So I had no complaints with it. Um, and then when it comes down to the actual songs on this album that you know brought about their their hugeness um i like most of the songs on here really it's a common theme and i hate to go back to it tons of steel the the brant song which that's one of his worst though that's i can't say that considering just a little light and i will take you home but it's probably in the bottom three i think i just not a very good song don't need another train song people we don't need another train song um i don't even know if it's about trains tons of steel it's not about a truck, right? Yeah, but it's about a train, I'm pretty sure. It's how, like, 
I, I just couldn't pay attention enough to figure out what the song was about. Don't like it. But anyways, the other songs are really good. Uh, Touch of Grey, I guess their biggest hit ever probably, right? Everybody knows Touch of Grey if you know music. Hell in a Bucket, a really good Bob rocker, good show opener, kind of cheesy lyrics, but it's good Bob cheesy, like late age rock from Bob, When Push Comes to Shove, a funky little Jerry number, West LA Fade Away, a slow, grooving, funky Jerry number. They usually had a pretty sick guitar solo in it. Great songs. Um, and what is the word? Oh, copacetic. The only song I know that uses the lyric copacetic. That's side A. Side B, you get tons of steel, a Brent song, which I don't think I ever saw them play that live. Um, to be honest with you, maybe they did, maybe I just forgot, but I, they did not stick around in their repertoire. Throwing Stones, just a great Bob song. And listening to that now, today, just how relevant those lyrics still are, um, pretty sad. But it's a political anthem of sorts, lots of commentary about a lot of things. Um, specific without being dated general without being too empty, I think. I mean, it's just a pretty good song and the music is just phenomenal. Um, and then Black Muddy River, uh, which is one of those songs that I have to admit as I get older, um, I like more and more. Uh, I don't know what that means, but uh, just a, a slow Jerry ballad, just a good song, a show ending type song. Um, not the most upbeat thing, I think, but um, it's a good song. It's a good song. It's a good Jerry ballad. So anyways, not, a, I mean, and it sounds great. I think the production sounds good. I think it's a fun album to listen to. Like, I think everything about this thing is just positive. And yes, um, that's a cool back cover. Um, yeah, I know it was a lot of people don't like it because of the way it changed the scene. But then when I did go to college and started going to shows and knew people who sold stuff and then started selling like, you know, food and drinks and stuff like that and knew people who made t-shirts and sold t-shirts, Having way more people at shows helped you live on. I really had no problem with it. Though the uh, violence that sort of pop, propped up because the public didn't know how to deal with more deadheads. Um, Patrick Shanahan, who died at the Los Angeles Forum at those December 89 shows. Uh, we went to the same high school together. I did not personally know him, but I you know, know, hey, that's Patrick. You know, I knew the guy. Um, I don't think I could have ever told you his last name. But you know, to be 19 at a show and someone from your high school was just like having a bad trip and like killed by cops um, in a chokehold, um, there was it was some frightening times, right? So there was a weird sort of like I'm not going to say they were frightening, but there was a very weird energy because there were a lot of people that did show up that were not there for the music. I mean, those people were present; they were there, and people like Patrick, who I'm pretty sure was there for the music. I knew him because we hung out in like the same circles. So I would, I think I even went to a show with him once where we were all on the lawn with like a bunch of people from my high school. Don't think I said a word to him that entire time, but like that was him, right? Um, he was not there to like abuse, you know, the party. Um, but because those people who were abusing the party sort of, I guess, soured the energy somewhat, People like him, you know, ultimately lost their lives. Adam Katz in New Jersey, you know, what happened in uh, St. Louis with the riot there. You know, there was some tragedy um, that came with the large numbers and, mm -hmm. and the dead not ever really having to control that. And now all of a sudden they're responsible for all these people when before it really did, from my understanding of it, was a much better time. But anyways, I'm ranting and raving. So now this is the story about how I found out that Brett Midland passed away. So we were in on tour heading to Chicago, 1990, for the very last shows of the 92 summer run. Picked up a friend of ours from the airport, and he, once we picked him up, it's like nine or 10 in the morning, we had driven all night to get there. He flew in super early. Um, he had tickets for the shows and had found us a place to stay at this guy Joe's house. Joe is not his name, I'm just gonna call him Joe. Um, so we drive down, we get to Joe's house. It's still way before noon. Joe is way too enthusiastic. Like he wants to barbecue, wants to go get beers, wants to party before we head to the shows, we're, the first show, which is later that day. And like, we're exhausted. We kind of want to chill, but we're trying not to be uncool. He convinces me to take him to the store. Apparently he doesn't have a car. Um, his house that he lives in, it's an, an apartment duplex. It's a downstairs, upstairs. He lives downstairs. There's like 
a wall of trees behind him, like really tall trees, and then this empty field, and there's no other houses, and like this pretty sizable empty lot that's a good couple acres, um, and nobody lives upstairs. Um, so he convinces me to go get him beer, and as soon as we get in the car, he asks me if I've hooked up with either one of the two women I'm traveling with, and if either one of them might hook up with him. Like just, but he doesn't use those words. It's much more graphic and kind of disturbing. I'm not liking this guy. Things are not cool. I'm just like, oh no, dude, we're just friends. This is not cool. No, man, just lay off. Um, I go, wow. one of the girls, like I pulled her aside, my, a friend of mine that I've known for years. It's like, hey, listen, man, you gotta, this is what he said to me. Tell her, like, this is effed up. So anyways, the rest of the day is just a little uneasy. We go to the shows. We get to the shows and he turns out he's a pretty cool guy. Um, he calmed down. We enjoyed the show with him. Everything was fine. He had pretty good seats and he kind of, he's got us down to much better places. Um, first show is good. We go back to his place. Um, we're all pretty tired. Um, some of us can't get to sleep, but we're playing music and chilling out and watching TV and whatever. Finally get to sleep like in the wee hours of the morning and at 6 a.m. he starts playing Uriah Heep and he's making breakfast and is like, hey, you know, Shaggy, what do you want? You want bacon? You want, you want it? You know, he's like yelling as I'm like, I've been barely asleep for like an hour and I'm a vegetarian. So the place smells of bacon. I really don't want any food. He lays a plate next to my head by like 6.30. I get up and begrudgingly like, you know, he made me food. I'm not going to be a jerk, but it's just, it's very forced upon us. So that day we, we travel around and we see some sites in Chicago. Um, just like I think Heather, I, and me and the uh, two of the girls, the other guys stayed behind and hung out and just kind of read and did stuff. Um, went to the shows that night, had a good time, uh, but it's pouring rain. It's like raining super, 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 super hard. Um, and we're like just drenched. Um, we get back to his house afterwards and uh, Heather and I um, don't want to go inside. Even though it's raining really hard, like we kind of are enjoying the rain. We're in the state of mind. We're like, this is cool. We're enjoying it. But he's insisting that we come inside. He's like, no, you can't. You can't go outside. It's raining. I got to go to sleep. I got to lock the door. It's not safe. Like he's being really, in my state of mind, kind of a jerk about it, but I don't know what else to do. So we stay inside. So Heather and I are just sitting there like kind of by the light of the TV, like in wet clothes because neither one, not a, neither one of us want to change yet. And I'm like, we can't sleep. That's completely out of the question. Um, so I go to the bathroom and to pee, and as I'm standing there peeing, he has a mirror over the toilet with like a, a medicine cabinet. And so I can't look in the mirror, it's just way too distracting. So I open the medicine cabinet, and there's like a pistol right there. It's the only thing in his cabinet. Like he's removed like the shelves, and there's just like this slanted, I think it's a pistol, it's a handgun of some sort. Probably not a pistol. I don't know guns, but it's a handgun, and I'm like, so I fucking close the cabinet, you know, pee, wash my hands. And when I open the door, the guy is standing right outside the bathroom door. And he's like, I heard a noise. Somebody hear a noise? And he's like heightened, freaked out. And I'm like, no, man, I didn't hear a noise. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, I don't know. He's like, okay, well, all right. He kind of looks at me all like intense and he goes back into his bedroom. And I go over to Heather and I stupidly say, he's got a gun in his bathroom. And she loses her mind. She's freaking out. She needs to get out of the house. She cannot be confined anymore. So I'm like, okay, we're just gonna go outside. We'll go, we'll open the door. We'll just stand under the awning and we'll be outside. So we do that. Takes us like what feels like a half hour because we're trying not to make any noise. Um, we get outside and we realize that in order to go upstairs, like the stairs are interior and they're like in the middle. So you go up this little thing and that's how you get to the upstairs. So we decide we're gonna walk upstairs um, and you know, just check it out. Like I mean, we're not thinking that he can hear us down below. We're not in, in a good state of mind. So we go upstairs and there's yellow police tape on the door and the, but the door is like wide open. It's just wide open and there's police tape over it. And at this point we're just like, yeah, let's just go in and check this out. So we go in and we're walking around and it's just an empty apartment. I don't see anything. Um, and I'm walking around, Heather walks into the bathroom and about doesn't come out, 
for like five minutes. She turns on the lights in the bathroom, the electricity still worked. And I walk in there and she's just staring at the bathtub. And I'm like, you know, what are you doing? Let's go. And you don't want to take a bath, do you? I'm like, what? And she's like, there's blood all over the bathtub. And I'm like, no, there's no blood over the bathtub. But she insists there's blood over the bathtub. And we kind of argue about this for a couple minutes, but I can tell she really thinks there's blood and she's scared. So I'm like, hey, let's just go ahead, get out of here, man. He's going to wake up. He's going to catch us. We don't want to be up here. So we start heading out. And I, of course, start seeing blood in the kitchen. I see it on the window. We both see what looks like smeared chalk on the floor, like a chalk body. So we're freaking out. We get out of there. We run downstairs. Um, and Heather's not gonna go back into this guy's apartment. Um, and we decide we're gonna sleep in the car. So I gotta sneak back in, get the keys to the car, which I swear it takes like another hour. And we end up spending the night in the car or we were awake most of the time. We fell asleep like way, way, way. Like once the sun came up, I think. But we ended up never going back in that guy's house, almost never again. I don't think Heather went back in the next morning. I think I grabbed her stuff. And after the show the next day, we were going to go back to Joe's house, this guy's house. But we decided to leave. Joe was not his real name. I don't know if I pointed that out. Um, so we head back to Berkeley after that. Tour's over. And we are off the grid 100%. This is 1990. We don't have cell phones. Uh, there's no internet. We're off the grid for like a week. Um, like we go, we go up to Colorado and we go like just camping for like four days. Like we have, no, we have, none of us have to go back. The semester doesn't start for like another couple of weeks. We're taking our sweet time. Um, we're like literally as off the, we have, we still have enough like supplies from tour. We're like, let's just use these before we head back. So we, uh, we finally get back about a week later. Um, we get back, it's like 7.30 in the morning. I walk in, uh, I'm, a, I'm in college at this point about to be a junior at Cal. Um, and my roommate is, he like, I, I get up at 7.30, he's still asleep. He's like, oh man, how was tour? What did he goes, man, how do you feel, man? You're pretty bummed, right? And I was like, no, I'm not bummed. I mean, bummed to be back, yeah. But he's like, oh no, you didn't, you didn't hear, did you? Like, oh my God, you don't know, do you? I'm like, I don't know what, no, I don't, what, what? Like, what happened? Like, and I'm really freaking out right now because he's obviously like, I, he can't believe I don't, I, I do not know. But at the same time, then he gets kind of giddy. He's like, oh my God, give me the answer machine. So uh, he hands me the answer machine. Um, so I hand him the answer machine and he pushes uh, rewind and he goes back to something and he pushes play. He goes, oh my God, listen to this, listen to this. Oh my God. And he puts it, you know, he pushes play. And then an answer machine was like a machine where you record your phones. If you're not familiar with it, were phone calls and you had a tape that you played back. So he pushes play and he plays it. And uh, the, first, the only message I hear is, hey, Shaggy, it's Joe. Guess what? Brent's dead. And then he hangs up the phone. And that's how I found out that Brent Midland died.